While we're waiting for people to get themselves organized, let me thank uh, Alma and Joe Gildenhorn who are sitting here. This is their book series, and um, they always look nice in the front row, especially Alma. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's old Steve Smith. Whoa. And Sally Bedell, the whole crowd. Hey, Steve and Sally, you get to sit up front near Ben. We have a rule, it's like in a Baptist church. If you come late, you have to sit up front. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, right. Hi, Sal. How are you? Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, one of the mantras is that the Internet changed everything. The more I think about it, and I, after I read Ken's book, it wasn't really the Internet that changed everything. In some ways, it was Google, or the notion of search, the disaggregation of newspapers and other things that search allowed, and the uh, advertising model that something like Google created. Uh, this is an absolutely seminal book. You really have to buy it. Anybody who wants to understand the media age, this is it. It's a narrative. It's colorful. It's enlightening. Let's start with how you came up with the notion of how Google destroyed the world as we know it. And you start with Mel Carmazan discovering that his advertising model sucks. Uh, Mel Carmazan was, the, was running Viacom. Uh, at the time, and it was two th early 2003, and he was the, one of the first um, people from traditional media to visit this company, which was then a private company. No one had seen its books. No one knew whether it was making money or not. And he went out to Mountain View, and he got a tour of Google facility, and they told him about the free lunches and the 20% time they give every engineer off. And, and he thought that was kind of cool, but he thought it was wasteful spending. And they described search and how it worked. And then they described the advertising system they had, and that the advertiser knew exactly who was, who was clicking on an ad. Uh, they only paid if someone clicked uh, and then went on to purchase something. They didn't pay otherwise. And, and everything was measurable, they said to him. And at the end of this four-hour visit where they had lunch and they met the former chef of the Grateful Dead, who was their chef, and they thought all this would impress Mel Carmers. And again, he's thinking this is all wasteful. And, and, but he didn't think it was wasteful when they described the, the advertising system and how he said, I don't want people to know. When I sell an ad for the Super Bowl, I don't want them to know whether people purchased. I want to sell the sizzle. I want to create enthusiasm and get them emotionally engaged to, to sign up and, pen, and spend, at the time, $2 million for a 30-second spot in the Super Bowl. And, and he said, and he looked, and they said to him, but that, that's very wasteful. It's not efficient for the advertiser. He says, I don't care about efficiency. And he ended this meeting, which is how I end the first chapter, <coughs> by saying, and you'll forgive me for my language. Am I allowed to? Sure, I just said soft oh, on okay. um, He looked at them, and he said to Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who were then 30 years old, and Eric Schmidt, the CEO, who was 20 years older, he said, you're fucking with the magic. And the next chapter begins with a Google that Friday, several days later, Google had its annual TGIF meeting, the staff, 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And they described to them what happened this week. And they said, we had this visit from this guy, Carmazan, from Viacom. And he, said, he accused us of fucking with the magic. And, and they said, yeah, you know. <laughs> and that's what they, they're doing. Let me take you way back um, to the founding and the algorithms and how these two kids do it. And uh, we're old enough to remember that this wasn't something totally new. There were many search engines, you know, and they're sort of forgotten, you know, the Magellans and Delphi's and all the others. What was the secret sauce here? Well, they, they wouldn't, the secret sauce really, I think, is that Google conveyed, and, and that, that these two guys in their 20s would have the, the clarity of thought to understand this uh, is, is actually miraculous, I think. They conveyed a sense to the user that the user came first. If you go back to 98 when they began Google, and there were, as you said, other search engines out there, the other, some of the other search engines actually charge people to rank higher in the search results. Google said, we're not going to do that. We're going, to, we're, going to give the, we're going to create an algorithm that basically gives people what we think are the best results, not what's the best paid for result. And the second thing they did was they, they 
at the time, the idea of a portal was a very important idea that you want to try and trap people in your wall garden. That was AOL, that was Yahoo's that was our philosophy. Mistake, yeah. and, and we want to keep them there, we want to give them all this information and not let them escape and, and, and will become, in effect, their internet uh, and their home. And Google said, no, 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 we're going to do a search. They'll come to Google.com to do a search, but then we're going to chase them off of our site. We're not going to have a portal. We're going to send them to get the information they want. And the same thing with advertising. When they finally came up three years later with advertising, they basically said to the advertiser, you can bid. It's called the Vickery auction system. Mm -hmm. You can bid for the ads. And if, if let's say, the, you're a sneaker company, and you, and you say, these are the search words I will pay for if people ask, search, and use these words. I'll pay for sneakers. I'll pay for basketball. I'll pay for playground, you know, uh, sandlot, whatever. I'll, I'll come up with some search words. OK, Nike, what do you bid? I'll bid 50 cents a word. They do this all online. It's not no human contact. And, and I'll bid 50 cents. And then New Balance says, no, I'll bid 25 cents. So Nike has won the bid. Mm -hmm. So they get the higher, they're, they're the first thing in that gray box on the right screen. You'll see the Nike when, anytime those search words are used. But what Google did, which won the trust of the, of the advertisers, they said, in a Vickery auction, you don't pay what you bid for. You pay <coughs> one penny more than the second highest bidder. So if the second highest bidder was 25 cents, they only charged Nike 26 cents. Mm -hmm. And they charged New Balance only a penny more than the third bidder. So the advertiser not only was getting, uh, only being charged when someone clicked on their ad, but they were, they were also not being charged what they actually bid. They were, they were being charged less. And that won the trust of both, these won the trust of both the users and the, and the advertiser. And I think that's a very important key to their success. Any survey you ever see about Google they are one of the most trusted brands and companies in the world. And that's because it, the, the, there's a, they communicate a sense that the, that the user comes first. And by the way, don't forget it's free, mm -hmm. which also matters. Uh, you describe a s similar type of auction system when they decide to go public, which kind of uh, unnerved people. It, it unnerved Wall Street and a lot of, and a lot of other investors. They, they said that we're going to have a, an auction system. We're not going to pay inside money to investment banks. We're not going to pay in their usual This is when fees. they did their IPO. Yeah, this was 2004. And they also said what we're going to do is, is we're going to create, do what the New York Times and the Washington Post did. We're going to create two classes of stock. We won't own a majority of the stock, but we will control the voting shares of that stock, the way the Salzburgers or the Grahams do, or the way Warren Buffett does. And, and, and this way we could assure, and we're going to tell them why we're doing this. And they wrote an essay as part of their IPO statement, in which they said, we want to focus this company on long range, not short term results. We're not going to give guidance to investment bankers on Wall Street every quarter about what our profit, or how, what to expect. Um, we're, we're not going to give out, we're not going to pay dividends. We're going to reinvest that money in long term growth. And if we want to invest in, in, in new plants and facilities and curb some of our profitability for the quarter or the year, we're going to do it. And that's what they did. Again, it, it's kind of extraordinary that these young guys had this clarity to create this sense, but all of which made it believable when they came up with the slogan, don't be evil. Um, uh, but even though they sometimes do things that people right. think are evil. Uh, which begins with uh, the notion that there may be a little arrogance there that you talked about. A little? Yeah. <laughs> No, you, you're talking about people who are engineers. And, and I mean, I asked Sergey Brin at one point, one of the two co-founders, um, I said, here you guys are, you, 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 you decide that you're going to just digitize all the books ever published in the world. You, you didn't really consult with the publishing industry or the Authors Guild and some of them. You decide you're going to put John Stewart's show on, on YouTube in 2006 when they bought YouTube. You don't consult with Viacom, which own, own that. Um, you, you decide you're going to do Google News and aggregate newspapers and magazines from around the world. You don't really have much outreach. I said, you guys seem to lack emotional intelligence. And he said, well, you know, it's not one of our strengths. And, and, and the truth is, they're engineers. And engineers are people who start from an assumption that most, most of the way things work now are inefficient. And by the way, they're right. I mean, think about newspapers, how inefficient they are. You're killing trees, you're expensively converting it to paper, you're distributing it very expensively in trucks and traffic clogged streets. It's a very expensive process compared to what you could do with Google News or, or the internet. 
So they're right about that. But the, so they ask these questions, why can't we do free phone calls? Why can't we put John Stewart on YouTube? Why can't we digitize all the books? But there are other questions they don't think to ask because they're engineers. They don't ask, for instance, what about copyright? You know, I mean, Sergey Brin at one point said to me, I, I, I tell the story in the, in, in the book, he said, he comes in on his rollerblades uh, uh, one morning. He just come from the gym. His hair is spiked, and, and he plops his back sack down and, and on the table. And he says, Ken, I don't understand something. He said, why don't you just publish your book for free on the internet? He said, you'll have many more readers than you would have by, in a paper book, right? Wouldn't that be great? I said, let me ask you a question. I said, if I did that, who would pay for my trips out here? I said, by the way, who would edit my book? Who would market my book? Who would do the marketing for my book, the book tour? Mm -hmm. I mean, who would, do, who would do my index? You know, who would legally vet the book? Who would, who would supply me with the support and the income I as an author need? And at that point, he was desperate to change the subject. But he had never thought, he had never thought about, he's at 30,000 feet, an engineer asking questions about an industry he doesn't know about. And he doesn't think that copyright is for protect people who, that's how they make their living, writing books or writing screenplays or whatever they do. You know, that's really the second half of your book, really, it's a theme, the whole copyright theme. And I guess it's been about 300 years we've had a copyright system since the Statute of Anne and stuff, where if anybody makes copies of something you produce, you have the right to profit from that. You have the copyright, not other people. For a period of time. Does it, yeah. Doesn't this whole Google system depend on the destruction of copyright? Well, they would say, and, and this is where it gets interesting, I think, th there, there are two, two big principles in copyright law that vie. One is, one is, is uh, copyright, which is, as well said, for a period of time, you own that. And the other is, is, um, is, is the... Um, fair use. Fair use, I'm sorry. Uh, and Google, what Google is about is trying to broaden the definition of fair use. Fair use means that, that you can take some part, you can quote, a paragraph or a, a small section. Uh, you can play a little piece of music, but you can't, you can't play too much. And the right. courts have never defined fair use versus copyright. So it, it's in this vague area. So Google and the engineers out there are very eager to expand the definition of copyright, which allows them to, for instance, and this is one of the reasons that spurred them to digitize all these books. They thought they could do it and show roughly 20% of your book. No, I mean, uh, all and, your books and all of mine are yeah. on Google Books and at least 20 percent. I mean, no, you can get 20%. any page you want after you've read 20 percent of the book in one session, right. you get blocked. But That's if you right. want to read it over three days, right. you can read the entire book and they I were, get paid nothing. They were pushing the envelope. Imagine if Google had said, uh, uh, Tim Wu of Columbia University is a law professor there, said, who was a big supporter of Google, but he said, imagine if Google, instead of going after books, or newspapers, which don't have the kind of powerful interest, say, in Washington that the movie studios have. What if Google had said, "Let's we're going to digitize all the movies ever made, and we're going to put them up? Including think, new ones. Yeah. You think they can get away with that? Never. Because mm -hmm. the Hollywood lobbying would, would have killed them. Mm -hmm. And what's happened then is that Google, this again, the emotional intelligence thing, Google rushes forward as engineers to do this, and they they decide they're going to digitize books, the publishers and the authors guilt sue them and say, you can't do that. And they get involved in the litigation and their negotiation, and they finally agree to pay $125 million to the publishers and the authors guilt for the rights to do this. And to people who are, who are accessing your book, will pay, Google will be paying you some money. It also allows Google, by the way, to sell books electronically, therefore competing with Amazon, which is kind of interesting and, and hasn't been uh, enough notice. But what happened then is that the courts have intervened because a lot of other interests came in and said, this is too much concentration of power for Google to be able to be the only one digitizing 20 million books ever published and having a monopoly of that. And what happens if they decide to start charging for that? And, and, and we ought to be looking at it. So there is actually a court case. And, and, and this coming week, there's going to be a hearing in a, in a And also court. in Europe, the European Commission is well, right. saying. But one of the things that the book describes, it, it, what I try to do in the narrative of this book is show how Google is formed and, and grows and who these people are and where they come from and their value system and culture of the place. 
But then as they're growing, how late the traditional media, meaning the publishing industry, newspapers, books, magazines, television industry, Microsoft, telephone company, music industry, Hollywood, how late they were to understand this threat and how they were complacent. And, and, and I, I'm, much, I'm much more sustainable, by the way, of, of the traditional media world than I am of, of the digital world. Because I, it was inexcusable for, for what they did and how, I mean, for the music company, for instance, to, to, to insist on selling CDs when Apple and iTunes comes along and proves you can, you can serve consumers' interests much better by selling individual songs and doing it cheaply. I mean, it, it just staggers me. Well, the newspapers, to create websites, online newspapers, and put the print people in charge of it, of this new media. That was insane. So everything comes back to me, and we can't break stories. Uh, you know, immediately we have to wait till the next day's paper came out, which was the original way that newspapers approach their online editions. Those things are insane. Well, you and say you're more disdainful of the old media for not reacting fast right. enough. But having read the book, you're also pretty, um, uh, you see the bad problems that have been caused by a Google that destroys totally the business model of traditional media. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting here is that you've got this, this unusual conflict in that Google is harming, um, and the digital, the internet, harms uh, traditional businesses. It changes their business model and, and weakens them tremendously, and I don't have to make that speech to, to this audience. We all see it in newspapers and what's happening with television and YouTube's growth, et cetera. But the, the, the thing that's interesting is that it serves the consumer very well in the short run. The consumer is getting information for free. Search, I mean, I have a library in my home because of Google. It's awesome, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just I, YouTube. I mean, I could do research on YouTube and find things that I never knew existed and never could have found before. I mean, film clips, old film clips of, or, or video of of people I'm writing about. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And by the way, you can search every book, including every yours, book. and find all those pages you need to find right. things out. It is truly wonderful, right. except... Except that, in the long run, the danger is that, that, <coughs> that, the, that it's expensive to, do some, to produce good quality television programs, good quality movies, or the New York Times to cover the world with a staff of 1,200 people. And it's expensive to do that. And if, if they don't have the economic base to continue to do that, we're, we as consumers in the long run will pay a tremendous price because you won't have, I mean, wh what replaces? Does a blog replace what the New York Times does in Afghanistan or, or Iraq? No way. Look, I mean, I was reading the Washington Post has both its AIDS series and it has an amazing story about the provinces in Afghanistan and which ones could be turned and not. Dexter Filkins did the um, just astonishing piece. Anybody's got to read it if they're going to figure out Afghanistan on General McChrystal in the magazine, in the magazine section. Right. And David Rhodes' captivity with the New York Times at great cost dealt with it. That story of his captivity tells you more about the mindset of the Taliban. I agree. None of those could exist in this new media environment especially because of the concept which you drilled down on that content must be free. No, I th it's actually one of the interesting things though, Walter, that I, I, I come near the end of the book, I, I dig into this. I mean, what, what is the future and, and for all of traditional media and for Google? And that's, that's where the book ends. And what I do is, is one of the things I discovered is I'm out reporting in Silicon Valley there's been a tremendous shift, and it's actually a hopeful shift uh, for traditional media in some ways. The, the shift is that, that people were saying to me, uh, who, who just a few years ago were saying everything should be free, it's the internet, and we should rely on advertising. But when the economic crisis began to hit in 08, late 07 really, uh, they began to see advertising dollars shrink uh, on the internet. And so a number of people, Mark Andreessen, who created Netscape and has social networks, began to say to me, well, we're thinking, we're, we're this close to asking people for their credit card information. And the president of Stanford, who's on the Google board, John Hennessy, said to me, I think we, our original sin with the internet was not coming up with a subscription model or, or a micropayment model. Walter wrote a brilliant piece about this in, in Time magazine. 
And, and I was stunned, he said, and I went to Eric Schmidt in December, last December, uh, for my next to last interview with him, and I said, uh, you know, your, your John Hennessy believes that you should be charging, that it was a mistake. He said, I disagree with that. It should be free. Free is the right model. My last interview with Eric Schmidt was April 1 of this year. And I said, do you still agree with yourself? <laughs> and he said, no, I don't. It was April Fool's Day, though, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I quoted him. Okay. And, and, uh, and anyway, he, sa and he then went on to explain why he said yeah, advertising is change, not enough. Too. He's changed. And even Chris Anderson, who wrote a book called Free, which came out in July, he's the editor of Wired Fantastic, Magazine. Yeah. And, and, but if, I haven't seen this picked up. I, I, I mentioned this in my book. Mm. But Chris wrote this entire book about why free is the model and, and it's the thing to do. But then he added a last chapter, which he called a coda, in which he basically contradicts the rest of the book. And he said, free is not the answer. He said, you have, we're going to have to figure out some other way to charge because it, it, in this climate, advertising dollars are shrinking, not growing. And so what that tells you is that, that there's an openness in, in the valley for the idea of charging, which is what traditional media wants. Google has already accepted the principle in the book settlement. They've agreed to pay $125 million. They've, they've begun to pay some people for content on YouTube because the engineers who were behind YouTube didn't understand, again, something that's about emotional intelligence. They didn't understand that, that advertisers don't want to have their friendly ads in an unfriendly environment like user-generated content. They don't want to watch their ads next to some dog pooping, you know? <laughs> and, and so Google has realized they need more professional content, and the way they're going to get professional content on YouTube is to pay for it. And they're doing that, and Google, YouTube was expected internally, three people told me in January, that YouTube would lose $500 million this year. Right. In July, person central to Google's operations said that loss would be down to between 50 million and 200 million. Why? Because they're beginning to get advertising because they've gone to more professional content. So you could see where people are receptive to the idea of paying for quality. And one last story. When I interviewed Larry, um, Larry Page in um, March, uh, March of 08, we're sitting down talking about newspapers. And he was saying he's thinking more and more about newspapers. And I, I, I actually reported in the book that Google at one point thought about buying the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and, and why? Because they feel that what they do is synonymous with what a paper like the Times does. This is a revelation to them. They've, they've grown into saying they need authoritative information to provide you with good searchers. And the New York Times is essential to, to, to retain good reporting. And so Larry Page talked quite eloquently about, he said, the kind of journal, he said, I don't want to measure journalism by the number of hits something gets. Because I know that Britney Spears will get a lot more hits than a story about Afghanistan. But I don't want that to rank higher on my search results than, than, than a story in the New York Times. So they actually have added to their algorithm. And it's still a point of contention with, with newspapers. But they give, no one knows what's in the algorithm except we know two things. We know that, that and, they, and there are good reasons not to know what's in the algorithm, because people, people could then game, game the system, yeah. But, but we know that it's based on the wisdom of crowds. The most often visited sites tend to rank higher. The other thing which I found out in reporting this book is they give more weight in the algorithm, I don't know how much weight, but to n stories in the New York Times, for instance. They do with some other papers and some books, I'm sure, as well. So they understand that that increases the, the, the authority of a Google search. So they want to figure out some way to preserve that. And they are literally meeting. The last time I was at Google, which was April, uh, I came down after meeting with Eric Schmidt, and I came down to the cafeteria. And who was in the cafeteria? Arthur Salzberger, Jr., about to go upstairs to meet with Eric and, and the founders. And of course, I then found out what they were meeting about and, and wrote about it. But basically, they're figuring out, how do we get help? for traditional media. And they're, they're working on it. Now, will they ever be, will they ever give the New York Times what it wants? No. Will they ever be able to restore it to glory the old days and those hundred people are going to lose their job in the next month? No. But there is, there is ferment out there and things are happening and that's actually a hopeful sign. It is. It is. Let me open it up. Dan, you want to? No? All right. 
A Tammy. A Tammy. Hi, I have a question for you. So if you're in their offices and they're feeling awfully guilty about destroying the newspaper industry, why won't they take the profits that they have and invest in it? I mean, you don't have to buy the New York Times. You could go to any of the movie companies, publishing anything, and have a pool of money, you know, some sort of fund to sort of back it up. Why don't they put their money where their mouth is? Uh, because it's their money, and they think, and they think that the, they probably think the New York Times and a lot of newspapers, are, and, uh, and certainly traditional media, are very inefficient and waste a lot of money. So why should they throw good money after bad? That's certainly one of the things they do. They, they would answer. They would also answer that look. We can't start a receiving line for everyone in traditional media who says, you know, come hat in hand and, and, and pour some money in our hat. Go for it. They're not about to do that, and they shouldn't do that. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and that, that's the, the point I was trying to make, uh, I, I make a lot where I have to stain for traditional media. The, the guy who runs Nielsen and Company gave me a nice analogy in the course of reporting this book. He used to be a general electric. He's now the CEO of Nielsen and Company. He said, there are two types of people I encounter. There are people who lean back, and there are people who lean forward. And, and, and traditional media has spent their career too often leaning back. What you need to do in this digital age is lean forward. And, and, and until traditional media leans forward, I wouldn't be pouring money in them the, the way Google won't. But Google won't for a lot of other reasons, including its bad business. But they have to. The, the point is, is there a point at which their interests dovetail with the interests of traditional media? And I'm saying there are. With search, there is. With books, there is. With YouTube, there is. With Microsoft, there is. would have an argument with that. The LA Times would have an argument with that. Uh, how far does it go? And what? how deep is their commitment and recognition that the kind of quality reporting uh, that has made this democracy strong get funded and continue? Um, I, I don't think it's deep. Uh, I don't think they're, they're understanding. I mean, you were talking about sophisticated. We're ta yeah, we're talking about engineers. Uh, and I don't mean that disparagingly, because in many ways, uh, one of the points I make in the book, the engineer are the, are, are the content creators in that world. Uh, they're the equivalent of the screenwriter and the author and the, and the journalist. Um, they're creating content from what they do. And, and, and they're treated like kings and royalty because of that, and because that's how they produce the money. But there are also people who, they don't read a lot of newspapers, and certainly the deaf. Um, and, and, they, and the appreciation of investigative reporting, they may mouth that slogan, Larry Page may mouth it, but I don't think he has a deep appreciation. I think he's too busy doing his engineering stuff. So, you know, you're not going to find a, a, um, a, a, it's not like talking to a fellow journalist who, who understands what the text of Filkins, what, 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 what the David Rohde piece, what, what that really told you about the Taliban in a way that, that, uh, that most of the reports I've read don't. And they, they don't have that level of sophistication. But they know that, that, that their interests, uh, they know better now than they did four or five years ago how interests go inside, A, and B, they know better than they knew just a couple of years ago that there are a lot of bears out there, meaning the phone companies and Microsoft and advertising agencies and Silicon Valley companies, and that, like Amazon, and, and Hollywood studios, and newspapers, and magazines, and book publishers, who are on their case, and are bringing pressure on the Congress, and the President, to, do, to, to raise the issue of the concentration of power that, that Google has. I wrote a book 10 years ago about Microsoft and Gates and the trial, and it's, it's actually the parallelisms are quite stunning. Here. Because I remember interviewing Bill Gates. Christine Varney as Joel Klein. Yeah, right, that's, what, that's <laughs> absolutely. And she basically has said, I'm going to look at concentration. Even though Obama, the Google people think Obama is, is one of them, and he made a great presentation, they thought, at, at Google in, in 2007 about an open net and, and saying all the things that was music of the years of Google. But his antitrust chief, 
is someone who's raised public questions about we have to look at concentration of power. And Google has tremendous concentration of power. But Microsoft and Gates didn't understand how the government could be questioning his motives. He was an engineer. He didn't understand things like fear, which is not an easily measurable thing. <laughs> Ten years later, the Google guys have the same density. You know, they, they don't understand the fear that's out there and the tradition in America of, of wariness about powerful forces. I'm and going to tell a quick story, if I may, that this involves Steve, who I worked at time with. But I, I was down for the impeachment of Bill Clinton, covering it for Dora, editing at the time. Saying, and I run into you in the lobby of the hotel and said, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going to the Microsoft trial because David Boyce is cross-examining Nathan Mirvold's brother. Right. And it was in the, uh, you know, the federal court. courthouse on the way to the And so I played hooky from the impeachment trial and went with you okay. as you covered that Microsoft case. Yeah. Sally and then David, yeah. Well, I just wondered what you think as an author <laughs> is the future of the, um, or what, what the result could well be of the um, settlement and the litigation. And the mere fact that already the Google system is completely obliterating copyright, doing what Walter said. You know, you can read 20% of a book one day and 20%, you know, and so uh, are those arguments going to be persuasive enough to force that, force I, it back to the or, to, Already, to, uh, to I, I saw, um, I saw um, Eric Schmidt at a press briefing in New York two weeks ago. And I asked him the question about, about the book settlement. Because again, a hearing is, is going to take place next week. And there will be probably more. I don't think a decision will come next week. Uh, but there are tremendous people have written, a number of people have written briefs opposing the settlement and asking for certain changes. There will be changes. And he telegraphed to me that he is open to making changes. And he said that, that David Drummond, who is their chief negotiator and chief counsel, uh, has the power to make decisions. So that it will be quickly done, it won't be long and bureaucratic. So I think they are open and they know they're going to have to change the book settlement. And they're going to have to be more re re recognizing more of the, the power of copyright and the propriety of copyright. Even though they have legitimate complaints about copyright, Disney being able to extend Mickey Mouse indefinitely. I mean, there are lots of things that are really cuckoo. Which are totally irrelevant to this discussion. Totally irrelevant to this discussion. Yeah, sorry. I, I just couldn't uh, resist it. I know. <laughs> David Jackson. Ken, uh, everybody We've in this room. We have three people in a row who worked for Time Magazine when I was there. I'm sorry. I'll try to call on non-Time Life Alumni Society members soon. We have a stake in this. Um, everybody in this room would pay for news. But what I'm concerned about is the younger generation who have become accustomed to getting news for free and see it as a commodity. Um, no matter what Google does, if they're not going to pay for it, there's no uh, there's no financial model that works there. What, what do you see as, uh, that would turn that around? You know, one of the dirty little secrets that, um, uh, that book publishers and newspaper publishers don't like to talk about but know is that people are not reading the same way as they did. Forgetting the commodity question and being able to get things for free. Do, do, even if you get it for free, do you read it? Or do you want to read it? And, and there's some evidence that, that they don't and that the reader reading is going down, and that Neil Postman was right that we're abusing ourselves to death. Uh, so it's a, real, it's a real issue of the future. The other issue, when Walter wrote that cover story in Time about micropayments or subscription as a way of getting money, and, and every, every publisher is now talking about, and in fact, the federal government has actually telegraphed their willingness to let them talk together. The Attorney General has certainly last spring said he would not object, if, if, as Nancy Pelosi had recommended, for San Francisco if publishers got together and talked about creating firewalls and, and, and charge for their newspaper content online. The problem, and, and, and Walter knows this as well as I do, is that if you have a system where, where the New York Times charges for its online edition and Time Magazine does and the Wall Street Journal as it does now and makes money does, uh, but the Christian Science Monitor, which is mostly online today, doesn't, or the AP and the wire services don't, uh, or the Seattle Times Intelligence, which is online now, doesn't, um, then, and if news is really a commodity, then it doesn't matter where you're getting it from. You can get it, and, you, and therefore you're breaching those firewalls, A. B, you're assuming that, that 
hackers won't figure out a way to breach those firewalls. And third, you're, you're assuming that, that, that it, it's a, I forgot what my third point is, but I'll come up with it later. But in any case, it's, it's a real problem of creating a, a wall that, that, that is impregnable. And so I think you've got to try it. There's an enormous problem creating that wall for those reasons. Well, the third point is free. I mean, yeah. are, 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 can you change the culture? Yeah, can you? But what you say and what David asked about <coughs> commodity news, if there's one of the bad things that's happened in journalism, in my opinion, in the complaints, is that we've sort of produced commodity news all the time instead of things like if you'll read the British papers, they're much more distinctive and they're not sort of the packed commodity news. If you had a system where people paid, it would be a tremendous disincentive to producing the commodity news because commodity <coughs> news would go elsewhere for. So you would be incented to do something special if it weren't just a race for more eyeballs for advertisers. That's the problem becomes, though, yeah. the, the contradiction, the, the negative side of that positive is yeah. that it, one of the one of the amazing things about the digital world is everything is measurable. And you know how publishers are. Um, they, if they can measure what people are actually reading or watching based on clicks, mm -hmm. and they see that many more people are reading not Dexter Filkins, but reading about Britney Spears, the pressure on the news to do more Britney Spears will become more intense because it's measurable. And, and that's the negative side of that. Oh, yeah, there's all sorts yeah. of things, although one can assume that if there are certain people who really want good news, like a Dexter Philippines, they might be willing to pay for it, and that would in allow it to exist alongside the Britney Spears, which can get the eyeballs for advertising. But I think I think we have to be realistic um, yeah. that that many newspapers will not survive, and and the prime candidates would be, you know, the St. Louis Post Dispatch, the Baltimore Sun, P New Detroit News, newspapers of regional cities like that are going to have a very hard time um, surviving. I mean, you could imagine that the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, though what Politico is doing was announced yesterday in terms of Washington's and local coverage, uh, Politico has done a tremendous job uh, nationally in, in, with the online edition and with their the 30,000 uh, newspaper they put out. Uh, but now they go local and they're making money already and they have 110,000 people now and they're going to hire more below that. That's a real menace, I would think, right. to the Washington Post. But so is Huffington Post a menace to the New York Times. I mean, Huffington Post has a, has a single employee in Chicago, one employee, one 25-year-old kid, who, who, who's Paul Goldberg's son, Ben. Yeah. As and opposed to in Denver, they have one kid who's David Axelrod's son. They got oh, a that's right. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah you bet. And, and what they do, that's Ariane Huffington at work. And, and what they do, <laughs> what they do is, is they sit there and they basically link to Chicago Tribune, Chicago News, I mean, and, and all the local people, and they're giving away their stuff. And, and they, they're just eating their lunch. So it's, it's I, I, the business will change. There'll be fewer publishers, there'll be fewer newspapers, there'll be fewer magazines. Uh, television will change. All this is just inevitable. Uh, but the hope is that you can keep quality in all of them, and that's a real challenge. There are two pieces I'd like pe uh, to tell people to read. One is Joel Achenbach has a really good story in today's Washington Post, front page of the style section, which is what happens to narrative in a world where people read electronically, because narrative is best suited for paper. It's a really long piece, which you can't read online. You better buy, You better get the Washington Post. If you can read all of it, in the end, you get yeah. one third quote. Yes, uh, I'm in favor of narrative, by the way. He, Steve proves he read to the end. But it also proves, you try to read it online, it's hard. But it is about narrative, and you lose narrative in uh, the digital age sometimes. And secondly, I don't know, I saw Charlie Firestone. Which Charlie? Charlie. Uh, there is a report that the Knight Foundation, the one with Charlie Firestone's program here, the former Communication Society, did on information needs of communities and how they're going to exist in this new world. And it's already gotten uh, FCC to appoint somebody yesterday, Steve Waldman, to be talking about information needs of communities, which is what we really have to worry about, not about the death of newspapers, but are we going to get information needs served in our communities? So Charlie has a good report. Yes. So my question, listening to you, and I don't know. You want to grab the mic, so we. Um, 
is the New York Times what's valuable, or really listening to you that what's valuable is the content that's provided by the, I'll call them the stars. And, and they're stars in local media and stars in national media. And isn't the change that needs to occur is to start paying, if you think about Hollywood, right, you don't pay, you don't pay because, wow, that movie studio produced it. I'm so excited to go see, you know, X movie studios production. I'm excited to go see the star. So the disintermediation. And so is the disintermediation a good thing? I mean, why do we need the New York Times? We just need the people who write for it. You know, there, there's a, uh, I, I, I address this, that issue in, in the book. And, and there, there are a number of people who make the, uh, Clay Shirky, who's a brilliant guy who teaches at NYU, who has written a lot of, of blog uh, on, on, about journalism is what really matters. And he's, he was basically mirroring the thought you just expressed, that the star, that individual, is really the, the key. I actually would challenge that. And I would say, I, without diminishing the importance of, of a really talented person, I mean, Martin Scorsese is Martin Scorsese. <laughs> Uh, Robert Caro is Robert Caro, and I, I don't belittle that at all. But the way journalism really works uh, is that it's a collaborative process. The, the, you, you have editors you work. I at the New Yorker, for instance, and, and I know this is not typical, but but I'll just give you what the world I know. But I, I know the same is true at Time Magazine or at, at, uh, at NPR. You're not out there alone. You are talking about an idea for a story with an editor or a couple of editors, maybe, right? And then you you go you go out and you talk to them. And the process of reporting that longer story, be an investigative story or a profile I may do in the New York, you talk to them and they say, well, they help you fine tune it in your thinking. And then when you hand them the piece, they say, no, I think you've buried the lead. It really is in paragraph 12 down here, and I think we should punch up this stuff. And then at the New Yorker, you know, when you hand in a piece, it goes around and different editors all come back with their, well, funnel all through your particular editor with their ideas for it. And then it goes to the fact checking department and you turn over all your notes, Cy Hirsch turns over all his notes, all his anonymous sources, they're known to the fact checkers and to his editor at the New Yorker. And many times, they, they, not many times, always, they call his source, sources and my sources. And so, and, that, and there are things that have changed in my pieces by the fact checkers. They say, no, no, this is not quite right, or you didn't quote this right, or the middle name is wrong, or whatever, you know, small or large. And then the copy editors are looking at it for stylistic reasons. So there are a number of people that are, are weighing in and helping you make that a better piece, or a piece of work. And the same is true at magazines. Now, you don't, may not have the same fact checking at some magazines, but it's a collaborative process. Certainly that's true in television. You know, we've got producers, executive producers, senior producers, and all that. So I think that good journalism often comes out of group work. It's it dependent on that one person, uh, but it's, it's group work. Can I, if you mind, if I add something? I mean, Ben Bradley has the old famous line of, I think this needs a little bit more reporting, and it was done. And before Woodward and Bernstein were stars, they were Metro reporters that had people making them stars. The things I just mentioned that I really care about the New York Times about, in the past week or so, are by people I had not really heard of hardly as stars. I mean, David Rohde, who I mispronounced even until you corrected me just a moment ago, that piece about the Taliban existed because there was an industrial organization, just like there is to make you know, computers at Dell, there's an industrial organization that sends a David Rohde, who I had never heard of, and he spends time and gets captured by the Taliban. And for that matter, Dexter Filkins. I mean, maybe some people in this room know who he is, but you wouldn't be a Dexter Filkins fan if the New York Times hadn't based him there in Kabul for a year and let him travel with McChrystal. So in all aspects of this world, including in Google in this book, you have an industrial organization that nurtures talent, whether it's algorithm writers or people who cover the Taliban. And that industrial organization is part of a process of making journalism, not just the stars on their own. Although we are moving to a model in which the Arianas and others get to sort of be stars, even though they've not been part of an industrial model. So do you need to save the industrial model? Not totally, but you need to respect what that model does, just like whether it's the model that makes Google uh, a good company is the same model that might create a Woodward, a Bernstein, a Rhodey, a Filkins, uh, whatever. Yeah. So 
parallelism. Following the parallelism you had with my, your first book on Microsoft. At, around that time, Bill Gates went from being one of the worst philanthropists in the world. You know, his, his initial grant was uh, windows to libraries in the form of about thousand dollars, amazingly, to being easily the best, and now with Warren Buffett's money, double the best. Uh, what you know, the, the, the Google guys hired Larry Brilliant at first. Things looked brilliant, and now he's gone, and uh, it really hasn't been the kind of investment a lot of us were hoping to see, or any kind of uh, coherent theme or, or movement. I wonder if you had any insights into that. They, uh, they, I interviewed Gates in 97 or 8, and where he talked, he said he agreed with Warren Buffett at the time that he wouldn't give money away philanthropically uh, until he was retired and he could do it more intelligently. I think the, the fact that he married well and, and his dad and the memory of his mother, who was very engaged and outside, helped bring him to, to change his view and helped bring Warren Buffett. He helped bring Warren Buffett to change his view on that. The Google guys actually started in a different place, uh, inspired in part by, by Gates and what he had done. And they, they, they are really bitter foes, but, and, and these are people who grew up in the Valley culture, which is Microsoft is the evil empire. Uh, but they, they admire and, and, and speak quite openly about their admiration for Gates and what he's done philanthropically. They dedicated 1% of their profits to Google.com, to, to the philanthropic. Dot org, yeah. Dot org. And, and they hired Larry Brilliant, uh, who is a brilliant guy and, as well and, 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 and very expansive uh, idealist. Uh, but they didn't think he, they came to think he wasn't a very good manager. And, and so they have not changed. They still give 1% of their profits to Google.org. Uh, but they now have Megan Smith, who is a senior executive at Microsoft, who also doubles as head of the foundation. A senior executive at Google. At Google, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy Merrill, how are you doing? Hi. Um, I'm just curious about the sort of building on the it takes a village analogy. Does Google have, uh, I mean, part, part of that village is a, the responsibility to get it right. And uh, so Google faces the China people there who killed if they're Googling the wrong things. They face putting a kid's video on there where, you know, the, the kids are embarrassed or they're really taunted. Did they, it, but that puts them in a publisher role too which then I, they should pay liable uh, insurance like the rest of us. So, so do they feel that responsibility of making sure it's right and, and sort of everything that goes with that? Uh, they don't feel the responsibility to make sure, <coughs> make sure it's right. They, however, as you know, in China and in Thailand and in France, they've had battles with governments because you, know, you can't search Nazi materials in, in France and Germany. For so they had to take that down from search. In Thailand, you can't disparage the king. They had to take that down from search, uh, reluctantly. In China, you know, I mean, they had, they had this, this crisis, and they, they basically caved uh, to try and preserve their business. So they made a grown-up decision for these very young men who saw everything with great clarity. With this, they were all confused. And I remember, uh, to tell you how confused they were, I attended a public, their annual public meeting Mountain View, um, and we don't get a lot of complaints because it's such a good business. There are very few shareholders who complain. But they had a proposal by one of the shareholders that they should not do business in China uh, because of censorship. What they did in China was they have two websites. They have a regular Google website that you can get uh, that is sanitized, and they have one that, well, they have one in China that's sanitized, meaning you can't, Tiananmen Square, you can't do any search on Tiananmen Square. There unless you want to see pictures of, not, not of tanks, but of park land. Uh, and then they have another one that's outside of China you can get to, uh, but it's harder to. And so at this, the, the, Google, the Google executives announced, the secretary of the Google board announced that the, the company had voted down this proposal to suspend relationships in China. And it was announced that Sergey Brin, who's a refugee from the former Soviet Union, who feels very passionately about some of these issues, had abstained. And that, to me, was an indication of just how confused they are. 
Because, I mean, I think he could have done more than abstain if he really felt that strongly. But I think here's the largest consumer market in the world, and they don't want to get shut out of it. And in fact, they've lost tremendously market share to a company called Badu, which is owned by the Chinese. And, and, and so they're, but he, he compromised, and they all compromised. Uh, as Yahoo did, Yahoo compromised much worse because they turned over names of some of their users to the Chinese government and they were in prison. But it's, and so did Microsoft, by the way. Uh, but it, it's, it's, the this is young people meeting reality of the world, <laughs> and sometimes trying to bend the world and sometimes being bent by it. Daniel, and then, then I'm gonna get to the back. I'm sorry, I'm in favor in the front. Dan Shore, speaking of new media. Thank you, <laughs> new media. I wanna take you back for a moment in this fascinating discussion to old media. I remember when television was invented. I, in fact, at the New York World's Fair in 1939, I saw the first demonstration of television by, by RCA. For a long, long time, uh, television lived off other news media, mainly newspapers. They quoted from papers, they tried to illustrate what papers were saying. Eventually, it changed and television became an originator of news. It strikes me that in this transitional period that you described so well, we may be in something of the same situation. The, uh, the Google and, the, uh, and, and similar media are, are living off news as, co as collected by others, which you illustrated with Dexter Filters and so on. But are we not headed for a day when newspapers are, are dying left and right or don't have the money to do Dexter Filkins anymore? And is there a day coming when Google begins to appoint its own reporters in order to give original news instead of merely copied news? Good question. Uh, Google would say no. Uh, they say we don't want to get in the content business. And they say they don't want to get in the content business for a couple reasons. Uh, a major one is search. Search is the heart of their business. That's what generates 97%. It's actually more if you count some of the special search they sell without advertising to people. Search is probably 99% of all of their revenue uh, today. And it's $22 billion a year in revenue, by the way. That's the same amount of money as magazine, consumer magazines in the whole country produce. And it's two thirds of what newspaper advertising is, all the newspapers in the United States. So it gives you some idea of how. When you say 99% of their revenue is search, you mean is advertising. Advertising. On advertising search. on search. And, and their, their argument would be, Dan, that. that, that that we have to be neutral in search. That's how we win the trust. And they can't think that we're like a cable company that's favoring cable channels that we own and giving them better positions on the dial. So the search results, what, what ends up at the top, is based on our honest algorithm. That's their argument, not based on whether we own content. So for us to be choosing winners would be counterproductive to our basic business. That's, the, that's their answer today. Yet on the other hand, they, they wrestle with the idea of saving, of trying to buy the New York Times. They decided not to for the reason I just cited. But they, they, they want to try and figure out a way to preserve good content. But I don't think you'll see them in the content business. The question is, will, the, will good content be able to survive? Will they, will they come up with an answer? And that, the jury's out on that, on that question. Yes, ma'am, back there. Thank you. Thank you, and Carolikas. Um, Ken, given your knowledge of both Microsoft and Google, how do you see the future of Microsoft in a Google world and in, in the universe of open computing and cloud computing and other um, developments in that direction? One of, the, one of the best business books I've ever read uh, was a book by Clay, Clay, Clayton Christensen. He's a Harvard professor, and he wrote a book about five or six years ago called The Innovator's Dilemma. And, and he basically, it's a book that could be about Microsoft, and it could be about CBS or the New York Times. Um, and it's about a lot of companies. And he actually names companies like Kodak or Xerox or Sears Roebuck. Companies at the top, of, they were at the top of their game. They were making a lot of profit. And along comes a new technology, the new way of doing things, catalog shopping, that's it, right? Um, cloud computing. In, in the case of Microsoft, digital cameras in the case of Kodak. And instead of investing in the upstart and meaning taking their eye off their major business 
and making, taking some dollars away from the business to invest in the new technology. The innovator's dilemma was, uh, what do I choose? And they, the, the companies that faltered tended to choose their existing business. And it's a terrible dilemma. It's a hard choice to make. You have a, a bird in hand, and you give it up for something that may not be, become a bird in hand. And, and that's the dilemma. Microsoft's dilemma is that they sell software in packages. Technology allows you to, to do cloud computing. What is cloud computing? Cloud computing is your email. Basically, your email is stored in a server. It's not in a cloud. It's basically in a, in a server farm somewhere. It's in a computer center. And, and it has all your email. And, and, but it's portable. Anywhere you go, you can access your email. Well, in the cloud, for instance, I'll give you a story. I have something called Dropbox. Dropbox is a, is a service program. It's free if you, you know, you don't use too much, which I don't. I mean, I don't use photographs and, and, and video on it, which you would pay, uh, you know, $50 a year for more memory for that. But I don't need it, so I don't do it. It's free, Dropbox. And, and my computer died last week, and I'm writing a New Yorker piece, right? And I said, oh my god, I can't get it out of my, my hard drive. I mean, it's literally dead. I can't transfer anything. But because the documents I was working on are on my Dropbox, which is in cloud, in the cloud, I was able to take out my laptop, put it on my desk, and just start writing off, because it's always there. Wherever I am, I can get access. That's what cloud computing is. So but Google is coming along and saying, why do you have to, spend, why do you have to buy a Microsoft Word for $300, right? Why don't you just, we'll give it to you for free, or we'll charge you less, or we'll have advertising, whatever, but it won't, you won't be paying, and you'll have total access to it anytime you want. Wouldn't that be great? Well, it is great. Dropbox was great for me last week. The danger is, I mean, we've seen it. Google has outages. Gmail, which I'm on, has outages from time to time. Uh, YouTube was, was taken down by something that happened in Thailand. Worldwide was taken down for about seven hours early this year. And, and so you lose the control. When I have Microsoft <coughs> Word, I, it's, on, it's on my hard drive. It's in my computer. I, don't, I have control of that. And I don't have control if it's in the cloud and it's, a, it's an outage. That's the negative with, with cloud computing and the danger. But you know, you don't have, sometimes computers crash as mine did last week, too. You know, so. But Professor Christensen's point is about disruptive technology. Is it Microsoft vulnerable? Oh, totally. I, I, I begin one of my chapters with an interview I was doing with Gates in 98. And I said to him, I said, Bill, what do you worry about in the future? What, what keeps you up nights? And I expect that he would say Apple or Netscape or, or Sun Microsystems or Oracle, one of his competitors. And then he thoughtfully rocked back and forth. Uh, <laughs> it's something that Walter, Walter experienced, too, because he once wrote about him. He did the same thing to me. He turned around and took a, a Diet Coke out of his refrigerator and didn't think to offer me one. <laughs> <laughs> I know what happened to you. Very, very when you wrote good it. memory. I and, forgot about and, that. And, uh, no, I remember because I said, oh, it happened to Walt. It happened to me, too. And I was so thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, I said, you know, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Robert. It's empty. Uh, but I said, so what do you worry about? And he said, you know what I worry about? I worry about some guy in a garage inventing something that I had never thought of. Well, you know who was in a garage in 98? The Google guys. They were in a Menlo Park garage and had a hand-lettered sign outside of this little creepy garage. Uh, Google Worldwide Headquarters, hand-lettered. And, and the two of them were in there with, with a guy by the name of Craig Silverstein, who was the first engineer they hired from Stanford, too. So, you know, and that was a disruptive technology. And, and um, cloud computing is a disruptive technology. But here's a quick follow-up, because you said 99% of their money comes from search, and that's why they're resistant to going out. Are they going to be hit by a disruptive technology because they try to crouch down and protect the algorithm purity of search? I think the danger to their search, um, the, Google has two dangers. Um, the, the, the search danger is is what's called vertical search. I mean, for instance, I do, and I, I, I cite this in my book, there's been a debate for years, who was the real William Shakespeare? And people have written books, many books about this. So I do a search, who was the real William Shakespeare, question mark. How many answers do you think I got back? Anyone want to guess? 650,000. 650, 650,000. What if I said 5 million? 
<laughs> now, that's totally useless. I don't have time. No one has time to go through five, not 6,500, not to mention 5 million. It's just impossible. So it's not a very efficient search when you think about it. And most times when we do a search, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. No, because they say on the top, it said number of searches. Anytime you do a search, if you look in the top, you'll see number of results. You know, 5 million. I couldn't believe it. It was five million and changed. I wrote down the exact number for the book. It's probably changed now. It's probably six million for all I know. <laughs> but in any case, it's not efficient when you think about it. So what would be efficient? A vertical search means, and there are some vertical search firms. Mahalo is one. Mahalo. Uh, uh, and what they do is they say, in fact, the, the guy who started it said to me, I can't believe the New York Times didn't do this. And you think about the Times should have done this. He says, I, I hired 10 experts to tell me what the 10 best I hire many dozens of experts. I want the 10 best restaurants in Paris. Write them up for me. I want the 10 best this, the 10 best that, whatever. 10 best cameras, whatever. And you can do a vertical search. The problem is that you don't, it, it, it's not universal the way a Google search is. Okay. But what might be universal? Well, think about social networks. Think about Facebook or Twitter. And think about if, if I am about to buy a camera and I have a Facebook page and I have 500 or 1,000 friends, and I send out a little blast to them. I say, I'm about to buy a camera. Has anyone ever seen this new Sony? And I give them the number of the Sony camera. Do you know anything about it, or is there something else you would recommend? And within an hour, dozens of my friends send me back recommendations. Isn't that much more valuable to me than, than a Google search? Well, you know your friends. <laughs> you know your friends, and you, you know whether they do or not based on the response. But they're familiar to you. The people on the on who was was there real William Shakespeare? I don't know who those five million in most cases are, right? So, so that's a real menace to Google. And it's one of the reasons why Google, even though they deny it, tried to buy Twitter last spring, because they know that that is a way of improving their search. Now, it's, search is not a static thing. So Google and Microsoft are every day trying to improve it, and they know it's an inefficient system the way it is now. So they're trying to replicate more of this vertical search way of doing things. But that is a real is a real threat to them. The other threat to them is that Microsoft, uh, Bill, uh, Steve Palmer, Palmer likes to say, well, there are, Google is a one-trick phone. And Eric Schmidt comes back and Google people come back and say, yeah, but it's a brilliant trick. And it is a brilliant trick. <laughs> okay? It's 99% of the revenue. They got a lot of other things they're spending money on which are not making any money. YouTube loses money, right? Android doesn't make any, their phone operating system, files doesn't make any money. Cloud computing doesn't make any money. But, and this is, this is, this is one of the reasons why I think Google is, is in, in good position, even though it's a one-trick phone, but a good-trick phone. Any one of those three things, YouTube, Android, cloud computing, hit, they figure out how to make a business out of it. It's a tremendous growth for them. And that's a challenge that they, can they, can they make one of those things work. They put a lot of effort into making YouTube, which they have great hope for. I mean, YouTube, half the people who download videos do it on, on YouTube. So it's, it's phenomenal, the traffic they get. If they could figure out a way to make money, which is by having more professional content, which will attract advertisers to do ads. And the ads have to be different. One of the things you, you, that, that I, I encounter in reporting this book, and I spend a lot of time in the advertising community, um, and we didn't even talk about some of the dangers there about privacy, but one of the things the advertising community realizes is that on a cell phone, ads don't work. I'm sorry, we interrupt this conversation so you can see our 30 second spot. It doesn't work. So what they're increasingly talking about is advertising as a service. That is to say with GPS positioning, you know, they know where you are at all times, right? And, and Ken, we know that you like um, certain kind of shoes, floor shine shoes, so I don't. <laughs> and, and, and you happen to be walking by a mall that is a floor shine shoe shop in there and they have a sale. You might want to go there. Or you're coming out and, and you press a button and you say, I, I need a lunch reservation. I'll, I'm at, well, we know where you are. These five restaurants have tables available. Press this button and we'll make a reservation. You know, that's a service. Someone's paying for that service, either the restaurant or you or someone, but it's in your bill or something. But in any case, that's advertising as a service, and that's something that increasingly, if they can figure out how to make that work, 
then you can figure out how to monetize advertising on cell phones, and then that's you know, humongous. But yeah, right here. Thank you. Um, I've been doing some investigative reporting on how the media, mainstream media, is or is not dealing with uh, controversial issue uh, issues, and um, uh, one being um, the eligibility questions surrounding the presidency and the constitutional issues there. And I've, I've heard that Google has been doing some. Um, mm, Culling of uh, their uh, files. Uh, have you heard anything like that? Culling meaning, meaning expunging right, stuff? Yeah. Uh, yes, Taking expunging things. No. I've not heard that, no. Other questions? Yes, Rem. Is that Rem? I can't yes. see. I got lights Thank in my eyes. Thank you. I'm reader. One of the uh, interesting developments, at least for me in recent years, has been the rise of uh, websites around the country focusing on local news. As you know, a lot of them do good work, but they're, they're pretty small for the most part and complementary to existing news organizations. Can you envision sometime in the future when, when the, these will be big enough or, or, or any, in any way resemble the, being able to put out the uh, army of reporters we've been used to in the past in the glory days of newspapers? You know, I, I can't imagine an army of reporters um, coming back. Um, I think it'll be different, and some of it may be better. I mean, you know, the truth of the matter is there's a lot to be said for, I mean, a lot of stuff in the blogosphere that's quite wonderful. And, and you get professors writing very knowledgeable pieces about subjects they know a lot about, and it's free, and that's, you know, that could add a dimension to your local newspaper. Uh, but, but you want to see, you'd like to see the wall stay up between the advertising side and the, and the business side and, and the news side and not have you know, stuff that's in there because it's favorable to this restaurant and they're going to advertise. And that's one of the worries you have uh, in this world where, where the rules are not as clear. But I don't, I, I think it would be really a mistake for people to imagine the good old days coming back. Um, in local Even in a very different form. I, I think, I think some, it, 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 you can have some good things happening and I think the Charles, what Walter mentioned, Charlie was working on, and, I mean some of that stuff out there, ProPublica, the Paul Steiger's working on, there's some yeah. really interesting things, I, you know, th th that, are, that are very exciting uh, that are going on out there. But I don't think you, you're not going to. I don't think the New York Times will be able to have a newsroom anymore, 1,200 people, and 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 that saddens me in some ways. On the other hand, when I looked at all the people, the breakout uh, of all the people who work in the different sections of the Times, it seemed like they were overstaffed. Well, they're um, going down 100. This yeah, book too. This book is really good. And my point of that being, it's for sale there. Politics and prose does it for us. Ken will sign it. The last hope of those who believe in paying for content and copyright is people who buy books and get them signed by Ken Alex. Great. Perfect. You're very good at this.